The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. That's newthinkingaloud.org. You can even order a printed copy from mta-magazine.magcloud.com. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the intelligence of the heart. With me is Dr. Julian Gresser, who is an attorney, had a private law practice in Tokyo for many years, and is the author of a number of books, including Environmental Law in Japan, Partners in Prosperity, about U.S.-Japanese cooperation in the commercial arena, Piloting Through Chaos, a book about negotiation, The Explorer's Mind, a book about discovery and invention, and The Laughing Heart. Julian was twice visiting Mitsubishi professor at Harvard Law School, and he has also been a visiting professor at MIT. He has uh, practiced Zen Buddhism and Qigong for many, many years as well. Welcome, Julian. Jeff, it's a Great pleasure to be with you again, and we've talked about uh, collaborating and exploring for many years, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet with you today. I'm very happy to be with you finally in the studio. I, I know we've uh, wanted to do interviews for <laughs> a, a, a quite a long time, and I really love your emphasis on the heart. It seems... Uh, Central. Well, in fact, the heart is really, you know, one might say, the central organ of the body. Well, we all have one, mm -hmm. I could say. Um, I refer to this new area of exploration as big heart intelligence. And it seeks to honor uh, the potentialities, generally the unexplored potentialities, largely, mm -hmm. of the heart in combination with the mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we don't, we're not forgetting about the enteric system in the gut, but particularly I'm interested in the interactions, how the heart and the mind work together. Mm -hmm. And I should perhaps uh, explain that when I'm referring to the heart, I mean not simply this extraordinary physical pump, but also the faculty, the capacity of the heart uh, as an emotional faculty, mm -hmm. as a perceptual organ or capacity, yeah. uh, as an emotional uh, capacity, as an ethical rudder, and indeed as a spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. All of these attend uh, the meaning of heart as I'm using it, mm -hmm. and it's particularly relevant to focus on the energetic capacities of the heart, because the heart, I have found in my research and in practical explorations, that the heart is a step-down transformer and step-up transformer of two very interesting forms of energy, those being qi, the Chinese refer to it as qi or ki in Japanese, it's a subtle energy, and love. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the poets uh, and writers throughout the ages have referred to the emotional aspects of the heart, and the heart is associated with love. We see that especially in, in the Valentine, the heart symbol yeah. of, of love. And yet, today, most uh, neurophysiologists would say, no, no, the uh, seat of emotion is in the uh, mammalian brain, in the amygdala, and uh, the other deeper uh, organs underneath the uh, cortex of the brain. <clears throat> well, it's true that uh, much or most of neuroscience 
is focused on the wonders of the brain. Yeah. But I think there is a small but increasing number of neuroscientists that are now getting interested in uh, how the heart actually plays the, the roles that I'm describing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the vagus nerve is one vehicle, one part of the anatomy which connects the mind and the brain to the functions of, of the heart. Right. Uh, but this idea of big heart intelligence that features particularly the heart as the governor, the governor of the mind energetically, mm -hmm. is a is not just something that I concocted. This has a provenance to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go back to ancient Egypt, for example, uh, the Egyptian embalmers would toss the brain and embalm the heart. That's right. Well, why yes. do they do that? Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you have this wonderful Egyptian collection in your house. Yeah. And one of these extraordinary scrolls uh, portrays the passage of a soul to the next world mm -hmm. in which the heart is placed in a jug. Yes. And it is weighed against a feather. That is true. And in this particular lucky individual, as portrayed in your uh, painting, the heart was lighter than the feather, which designated it and entitled this particular soul to enter the next world. The realm of Osiris. The realm, yeah. the realm of Osiris. So yeah. the Egyptians understood this very well. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if you look to most indigenous peoples, if you look to the Native American traditions, right here in Albuquerque, I went to this wonderful uh, Indian Pueblo Museum. And there the heart is honored mm -hmm. uh, in the Native American communities, not only at an individual level, but as a ve vehicle for connection to community. Mm -hmm. And this is really pretty fundamental to the ideas that I'm exploring in a very practical and sort of modern way. It, it seems as if our Western industrial culture has, uh, to some degree, to a large degree, denigrated the role of the heart. Yeah. Well, I think that... Um, in several respects. One is that um, uh, there's, a, there's a very strange sort of alignment of values and value judgments. The heart is seen as emotional. Mm -hmm. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Yeah. Actually, when I was beginning to practice law, I mean, one of the senior partners used that as, sort of, as a way to sort of... Uh, capture and describe the, in a not terribly positive mm -hmm. way. You know, he wears his heart on the same, meaning sort of emotional, sort of not quite stable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting. There was, uh, I am told, I, I wasn't there, but that one of the dicta or great sayings of uh, uh, Dean Griswold at the Harvard Law School, he said, we, at the Harvard Law School, we train the mind by narrowing it. Uh, <laughs> and the idea was, but this is, you know, it sounds awful, but actually lawyers pride themselves of sort of stripping out emotions mm -hmm. and being, bringing hard, yeah. steely logic to dealing with problems. And I know the heart and emotions in general are considered feminine. In our culture, the feminine is That's denigrated. Right. It's right. like women read romance novels, not men. That's right. And uh, the central point that I would like to make today mm -hmm. is that the heart is an is an extraordinarily energetic uh, faculty. Mm -hmm. We know that the electromagnetic uh, energy field of the heart is actually greater than that of the brain. Mm -hmm. So just from basic physics, that means that the heart is an organ of enormous power. Much greater than the brain, isn't it? Well, I don't it? know whether the power of the heart mm -hmm. is greater than the, than the brain, but the, the key point is that the heart is both an energy field mm -hmm. And a power center. And the deep question is, as one learns to cultivate this power for practical use, how do you modulate it? How do you keep it in balance? Because I think there is along with the, it's an odd contradiction. On one hand, as you say, in our culture, there is a, uh, a, a, a trivialization of emotions in the heart, which is mm -hmm. regarded as sort of feminine. Yeah. Which is a, on the other hand, there is a really deep concern, particularly among those who are interested in, you know, sort of consciousness and areas of that, that about power. Mm -hmm. There is a bias. There is a notion that power corrupts and, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. But the, but we, my whole thrust of my work is that we should not run away from the power of the heart when combined with the mind, but, but particularly the heart is important because it modulates, it tempers the use of power. 
Well, you are a student of Qigong, and uh, I've studied some Qigong, at least enough uh, uh, where we were led to believe that the center of power isn't the heart, it's the uh, called the Dantian or the solar plexus area. Yeah. Well, in a lot of Qigong practice, as, as mm -hmm. well as the practice that I do, it, that you, the, the, the Dantian or the, the, uh, the abdomen, lower abdomen or the Hara mm -hmm. in Japanese, is the, is the battery. That's the repository. This is where chi is stored. Mm -hmm. But in point of fact, we're not, we're not components. We're an integrated <laughs> system, right? Yeah, yes, and indeed. so the gut, mm -hmm. the gut, the heart, and the mind and the brain all work really synergistically mm -hmm. together. And this is what I've discovered in practicing qigong, uh, is the enormously interesting practical applications. For example, in business, mm -hmm. in negotiation, yeah. in the architecture of strategic alliances where trust is mm -hmm. actually essential, mm -hmm. uh, in dispute resolution. In each of these areas, heart, when you reintroduce heart in the sense that I'm using it, it has profound transformational mm -hmm. uh, applications in each one of these very practical domains of knowledge. Well, you, uh, we started by talking about the intelligence of the heart, and there's a sense in which the, the heart has ears, the heart has eyes, it can sense things, uh, perceive things is probably a better word, that uh, the mind uh, often misses. Well, that's true, and I, you can easily demonstrate this in about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. For example, all you have to do is take the image uh, I just use this as one of many ways you can do it. The image of a moon quietly shining over a still lake. And you take that image into your heart and you quiet your heart. Mm -hmm. You quiet your heart. We, we, we learn about quieting the mind. But if, if I am correct, as some of the Qigong masters suggest, that the heart is the governor of the mind, mm -hmm. then you get a tufo. Because if you quiet the heart automatically, the mind quiets down. Mm -hmm. And the minute you then stop the practice, you see, you see connections in ways that you never saw before because the heart is an integrative faculty. Mm -hmm. And so you begin to pick up changes and perturbations in what called a field effect. Mm -hmm. And you see relationships that you didn't for because the heart is quiet and therefore the mind becomes quiet. I know in the yoga system of chakras, there are seven chakras, and the heart is right in the middle. I see it as integrating the what I would call the lower emotions, possessiveness, anger, uh, lust for power, uh, and, and lust in general, the erotic emotions with the higher centers, uh, visionary, creative, uh, romantic love, and uh, the ability to uh, communicate effectively. Uh, the heart is really at the center of all of these. Yeah. And if there was one word, mm -hmm. one word that would summarize everything mm -hmm. about what I'm calling big heart intelligence, that word would be vitality. Vitality in a very deep sense, not just simply physical vitality, emotional vitality, uh, spiritual vitality. And that vitality comes from a sense of connection. Mm -hmm. Connection first within ourselves. We are so busy these days. Our attention is so scattered. We lose connection to what's really important in life. Connection to our friends, mm -hmm. like you, can, that opens up new possibilities yep. in life. Connections to nature. Mm -hmm. We're divorced from nature because we're moving so fast. You know, video phones, everybody's doing this and this, clicking away, you know? No time to sort of step, step yeah. aside, mm -hmm. quiet down, and reconnect to what's really important in our life. That is intimately tied to this idea of vitality. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can share a personal story with you, Julian, after the uh, recent presidential election, I'm a lifelong Democrat. And I normally don't discuss politics, so this isn't really about politics at all. I was just very disheartened by the election. And I kept telling myself and telling everybody else, I'm so disheartened, I'm so disheartened. And what I discovered was I lost vitality. I began to slow down. In fact, my heartbeat was literally slowing down. I measured it at like about 40, even below 40, like 36 or so. And 
I made an appointment with my cardiologist. I've got to get this condition corrected. And he was going to set me up with the 24 hour heart monitor. And it was at that time I had to wait three weeks for the heart monitor. So I thought to myself, I finally realized, wait, I'm giving myself a mental suggestion. Every time I say I'm disheartened, I'm telling my heart to, to, slow down. And I said, if I'm doing that to myself, I can reverse it. So I began canceling all those thoughts about being disheartened. And I began to uh, tell myself I am heartened. <laughs> and and by the time I had to take the 24-hour heart monitor test, everything was normal again. Isn't that terrific? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there is a very close relationship between vitality mm -hmm. and the stories we tell ourselves. Yeah. When we are very busy or when we're very stressed out, it is often the case that the heart field tends to compress, mm -hmm. constricts. I mean, anxiety, I'm, I'm told, I don't speak German, come, in German comes from the word, I mean, angst has to do with constriction. Oh. So when the, when the heart energy field constricts, of course, then we become more anxious and, more, and you have physiological consequences. Mm -hmm. But there's some very powerful techniques that I've, uh, that I've learned. And the simplest proposition, which is related to vitality, is you don't have to believe your thoughts. I mean, it's such a simple idea. Mm -hmm. But most people assume that if they feel something really powerfully and if they believe something very strongly, it's true. Yeah. But but often it, I found that it's not true. It's just a thought. It's just a thought. Yeah. It's sort of like uh, in Macbeth, Shakespeare refers to the bubble. There are bubbles on the earth. These are thoughts. These mm -hmm. are just bubbles. These mm -hmm. are thought forms. And if you explore whether a particular story that's disempowering you or disheartening you, heartening you is really true, yeah. you ask yourself, is this true? Can I be a hundred percent certain it's true? Mm -hmm. Often, you can't be 100% sure. And then if you ask yourself, well, how do I feel about that? How does this make me feel since it's making me feel awful? Yeah. And so then you say, well, what would I be like if I didn't have that thought? I could just as easily have been saying to people about that election or any other event, it's energizing me. It's energizing, of course. Yeah. And then I found that more often than not, if you really explore it, and particularly the heart is very useful because the heart is like a refuge. It's a mm -hmm. sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So you go into your heart and you sort of say, you know, if this makes me, f it doesn't seem that I have proof that it's true, this thought or this story or these images. Which, and if they're, it's, it makes me feel awful and I have no basis for it. And I'd feel terrific if I didn't have that thought. And it's quite amazing that I've often found that more than likely, more than 50%, the opposite is more likely to be true. And so this whole process uh, is greatly enabled by the cultivation of the heart. Mm -hmm. And so the more you cultivate the opening, opening the heart, yeah. the more you're able to deal with the buffets and reverses of life mm -hmm. because you're not tossed around because mm -hmm. so many of them come with stories. And I found that the more you do this kind of practice, the more reverses are often gates Mm -hmm. Of opportunity, they, you know, it's often said one gate close opens another. Yeah. But Shakespeare said, "Sweet are the uses of adversity, and as you like it, sweet are the uses of adversity." But he doesn't explain to you how. <laughs> but I'm trying to say that the heart, mm -hmm. as you cultivate vitality, it gives you a resilience that enables you to go into difficulty, go to, into it, and therein find your power. Mm. Uh, and so what often what looks like really pretty serious or troubling events, you know, life comes, life isn't sort of sim a simple package of goodies. It comes, many things in life have different kinds of dimensions. We all and have trials and trials, tribulations. And it comes with different colors yeah. and different, you know, valences. And if you can be develop this capacity to surf uh, through the difficulties of life, and I think heart and vitality are really critical because mm -hmm. anybody can do well when everything is good coming their way, right? Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to, to then, as we see in the book of Job, you know, of course you would honor God and thank the universe. But what about the dark times, mm -hmm. you know? Can you create your own luck in adversity? Mm -hmm. This is the real challenge. And I found 
I, I, I don't present myself as some sort of grandmaster. These, these are my own discoveries, but I find that they are empirical, empirically validatable mm -hmm. and verifiable. It strikes me, Julian, that we often go through life, though, with our heart closed, and the reason is because we're protecting ourselves against, you know, the insults being hurled at us, or even from having to feel the pain of other people. If, when you open up spiritually and psychically, uh, you feel compassion for others, but that's often hard for yeah. people. So, you know, I noticed this when we begin our video recording. Uh, we start with 20 seconds or so of silence so that I can filter out the air conditioning noise right. from the audio signal. But I use that as an opportunity to just open my heart a little bit. It takes only like a few moments to kind of let go of that numbness, which is sometimes our natural condition. Yeah, well, this is a profound societal problem, and it's called burnout. Mm -hmm. It is said that the present mm -hmm. societal costs of burnout in the United States are about $350 billion. Mm -hmm. Burnout is not just simply that you lose energy. Burnout is a profound uh, complex of... Uh, uh, phenomena. Of course, you're enervated. Uh, you're depressed. You lose a sense of meaning in life. Mm -hmm. You lose a sense of joy. You become anhedonic. Uh, you lose your direction. In Japan, the phenomenon is so severe. You get physical illnesses. In Japan, it's so severe that the phenomenon is called karoshi, which means sudden death syndrome. Mm -hmm. You just suddenly die. Mm -hmm. And this has a lot to do <clears throat> with over busyness, over pressure massive stress, and a shrinking of heart. And we have developed a, what we believe is an antidote to burnout. Mm -hmm. And this is applies particularly in the caring professions, mm -hmm. in healthcare and medical. But you see it throughout, you know, throughout the professions, throughout industry, and yep. so forth. And I believe a key to reversing burnout or preventing burnout is the steady cultivation of the heart and the mind, mm -hmm. which goes to vitality. Because mm -hmm. when you have robust vitality, you have resilience and you have an opening to reverse burnout and certainly to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Well, are there particular techniques we can leave our viewers with? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I have it uh, summarized in my book, which I call 10 Essential Moves. It's mm -hmm. a, the full title is Laughing Heart a field guide, and sort of like Audubon, a field guide to exuberant vitality for all ages. And this book, as I understand, is on the internet. Yeah, this is an online living book. And it's living because it learns each week. Mm -hmm. And we have the technology so it can be interactive and personalized. Mm -hmm. But just to summarize, in a, in a matter of hours, you can increase your big heart intelligence. The first part of the book to try is intended to try to give you an experience, a direct experience of what I call this state of big heart intelligence. Mm -hmm. This is a state of heightened vitality, of empowerment, of deep relaxation, of a sense of balance, of joy, an increase of compassion and flow. Mm -hmm. Now, each one of these areas, like a great professor in the University of Chicago, uh, Hungarian professor wrote a series of books on flow. Mm -hmm. And of course, mindfulness. Chick sent me high. Is, I know, <laughs> I've, I've interviewed I've him. Yeah, he's me a high. wonderful, deep, mm -hmm. deep thinker. Yes. So each one, there are many different areas that can contribute to this, but we've sort of integrated yeah. it all. Mm -hmm. And this experience of big heart intelligence, you can immediately validate, first through quieting the heart, second of all, finding your power, mm -hmm. third, discovering beauty. Beauty is deeply related to the sense of vitality, uh -huh. particularly expanding your sense, the zone, if you will. Uh, this friend, a great uh, Zen teacher in Japan referred to it as expanding your, the market share. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the market share. He's the head of, a, he was a vice president of Mitsubishi Bank, he thought mm -hmm. in these words. Take time know. to smell the roses, yeah, in yeah. other words. And, the, yeah. and connecting to nature. Yeah. This is what gives you the foundation. Mm -hmm. And then beyond it, you can start to explore and so there are various techniques. But love, particularly, is an enormously powerful enhancer of the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, so love is a great vehicle. And you can actually expand, just like you can expand your sense of beauty, 
you can expand your capacity to love. It's pretty easy to love your dog or love your wife or love your children, you know, but can you, can you really love your friends? Can you love a stranger? Mm -hmm. So this practice, it opens the heart and that's intimately tied. And the last part section of the book deals with paying forward. Mm. <clears throat> paying forward, you know, Emerson wrote his famous essay on compensation. Beware of too much good coming your way. Mm -hmm. Hasten to pay it forward, line for line, deed for deed, cent for cent. Mm -hmm. Now, why does he say that? Particularly if you look at it from an energetic point of view. <clears throat> and the key is that the more we, and there's data, there's really good sociological yeah. data, that the more wealthy we become, often the more stingy, yes. the more our heart shrinks. Yeah. But if you don't hold on mm -hmm. to what the good that comes your way, because then the chi stagnates, this vital force mm -hmm. thing, you pass it on and you don't ask anything back. You just pay it forward. You pass yeah. it on to help increase the quotient of joy in the world or happiness. There's a wonderful there movie by that there very is. name there is. That, that really makes this point. And then, and then you sort of, or you, you help to reduce a bit of misery in the world. Mm -hmm. And you don't ask for anything back, rewards. Yeah. Or, now, what's really quite interesting is how this is related. And I found an empirical validation of this principle, which I call creating your own luck. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is <clears throat> that the more you cultivate this capacity to pay forward based on good things coming your way, I have found it attracts more good things to you. <laughs> and you can actually track this phenomenon. Yeah. If you were to measure on or just track on the top line, for mm -hmm. example, good things happening, you know, I met Jeffrey, I came back, the dog ate up the uh, the opera tickets and so <laughs> forth. So, you know, you, you do a waveform like that. And then you look at these sort of inner variables. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at pay forward. It, a, it a more immediately follows a, it, it, it's, it resets the dial, as mm -hmm. it were. And so as you pay forward, interesting good things happen on the external line. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do this with whole communities, then the vitality moves out from the individual to the family, to the tribe, to the organization, through a whole community. And that's really my, my real passion, is to show how this concept or these principles of enhancing vitality can be used and practically deployed to enhance the, the health, wellness, and vitality of communities. And we were now seeing a phenomenon around the world where local communities, and this has been greatly validated in, in the UK, but there's a yearning of local communities in the world today to reclaim control mm -hmm. over their own health, wellness, and vitality. Mm -hmm. To move away from this provider-centric model yeah. to one that is based on community self-initiated, not antagonistic to the present system, mm -hmm. but in a in an alignment with it. And so this process of what I'm calling big heart intelligence, I think, can be enormously empowering to local communities as they chart their own de health destiny. In, in other words, uh, it can be very beneficial to community health. To community health, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just now launching a project where we would work with local health care uh, providers mm -hmm. and, and local governments yeah. because every government is required by federal law <clears throat> to prepare a health needs assessment and what happens all the time is... This is in the U.K.? And in the U.S. In oh, the US, in the U.S.? By federal law, yeah. yeah. I think it's a uh, 2010 statute. Hmm. And m most local communities, the same constellation of challenges come up. Health literacy, obesity, diabetes, chronic il illnesses, drug and substance abuse. And what's so interesting is the behavioral, ch behavioral changes are common to many of these. Mm -hmm. So that if you can affect or help support curated best practices by enhancing them through what I'm calling big heart intelligence, you get a very interesting mm -hmm. multiplier effect. In other words, health literacy alone, which is a trillion dollar global problem, I believe can be substantially addressed if one could in supplement can the best practices with this new technology and methodology of big heart, which is based on vitality. Take obesity. Obesity is intimately tied to diabetes, to various forms of chronic illnesses, hypertension, and so forth. Hugely in integrated, complex problem. But if you can help, at the margin, improve people's sense of vitality and power, 
around obesity, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you have a cascading benef set mm -hmm. of beneficial effects. So what you seem to be saying, if I can summarize, Julian, is that humanity is faced with problems that seem to be, if not intractable, perhaps even getting worse. The obesity epidemic being one e example, the uh, disparity between the rich and the poor being yet another example, and all sorts of uh, forms of social oppression of various groups, whether it's females or people of color or people who have uh, very varied sexual preferences, or yeah. people who are interested in exotic things like parapsychology, these problems seem intractable. And I wouldn't call an interest in parapsychology a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so, but, but try and get a, a university position as a parapsychologist, <laughs> and you'll discover right. what I'm talking about. I happen to be the only person in the world who ever got a doctoral degree in parapsychology, and it's because I could say, oh, there's this terrible social prejudice. What am I going to do? But I'm very happy with my yeah. life, the way things have turned out. But my, my point is that problems that seem to be getting worse or that nobody seems to have a solution for that can't be addressed, that maybe the solution is in a kind of a community engagement and opening up the heart. Well, I think that's certainly part of it. And mm -hmm. I think the, you know, I think the wonderful part of this is we don't have to be grandiose. You can begin in very simple ways. Uh, you know, Camus wrote that uh, great changes in the world are somewhat like the, uh, the whispering of doves. You know, a little, a mm -hmm. small voice can then become a big voice. If you can show tangible pri pri progress in one local community, if you can help people begin <clears throat> to, to deal with each other more with, as Dickens said, with kindness, patience, and cheery ways. I love this phrase, cheery ways. Mm -hmm. You know, and connect that to the deep knowledge that local communities have. I might just say, you know, just as a, now you mentioned poor communities. Uh, it's true that in our present economic system, many communities truly are financially poor. Mm -hmm. But what's so interesting, I've discovered that they often are great reservoirs of wealth, mm -hmm. wealth in terms of wisdom, of kindness, of generosity. Mm -hmm. Of, of patience, forbearance, and love. Mm -hmm. What if there was a way, what if there was a way to harvest these resources, these assets, in a way that people could actually earn livings from them, that could be exchanged mm -hmm. for a beneficiary for other goods? I think we're really at a new economic frontier, which is mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm trying to do. So I think, as you said, <clears throat> many of these would look like absolutely intractable problems. I think we're at a, the dawn of a whole new an era of possibility mm -hmm. uh, where that which seems impossible uh, a few years ago, and we see this clearly in medical science, is now becoming possible. Mm -hmm. And so it's less scientific or technological challenges. I think the real challenges is where we've been discussing today. Can we begin <clears throat> to take away these you know, hearts of stone and have hearts of flesh? Can we begin to deal with each other, to take the time to be kind and generous? Of course, there's so much of that also in the world today. If we can find ways at every level of society to reinforce it, I think we will see a sea change. Mm -hmm. Julian Gresser, what a wonderful discussion. Uh, he reminds me of a quote you shared with me earlier today from uh, George Bernard Shaw, I believe it was. Uh, some people look at the world and say, why? And I look at what could be and say, why not? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a wonderful way of living. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being with me. I really appreciate the time, Jeffrey. Thank you. And thank you for being with us.